In this video, I'm going to start unpicking the process that you use when choosing springs for off-road vehicles. I'll explain natural frequency and what an appropriate one might be for an off-road vehicle. I'll also explain some of the compromises you have to make between ride, handling and mobility. At the end of the video, I'll explain the differences in selecting springs for beam axle vehicles and independent suspension. Why bother to have a sprung suspension at all? There are two jobs that having a sprung suspension do for you. The first one is that it allows the wheels to conform to uneven terrain. And that applies whether it's an off-road vehicle or an on-road vehicle. So you can imagine if you didn't have a sprung suspension, if the wheels were rigidly mounted to the chassis, then it'd be like having a table with one short leg. It'd always be wobbling. You'd never get proper contact between all four wheels and the ground. And that's a bad thing because the only way you can generate any tractive force or any steering force or any braking force is if you're pressing the wheels down onto the surface. So if you didn't have suspension, if you didn't have a sprung suspension, then it wouldn't be possible for the wheels to conform to the terrain and consequently it'd be much harder to control the vehicle. Obviously off-road where the terrain is potentially much more uneven, that's a much bigger problem. You want the wheels to be able to reach the surface. You want the, the wheels to be able to uh, distribute the vertical force of the vehicle evenly across all of its wheels. The other reason for wanting a sprung suspension is that it absorbs the shocks that result from vertical accelerations affecting the vehicle. And by that I mean if you hit a bump and it tries to push the vehicle upwards, you want the suspension to absorb that force, or indeed if you're landing, if the, if the vehicle has jumped over a, uh, a hump or something and you're landing on the other side, then you want the suspension to absorb those shocks. The ideal suspension would completely isolate the body from the form of the surface. So the body would carry on completely flat, completely smooth, and the wheels would be going up and down to, to conform to whatever shape the surface happened to be. Now it isn't really possible to do that uh, unless you use an active suspension. Active suspensions are a bit niche. Lots of people have tried them over the years. Uh, but the power requirements for them off-road uh, really make them prohibitive. Like so many aspects of off-road vehicle design, suspension design is a compromise. So on the one hand, it would be really nice to have a very soft, very long travel suspension, because that will give you the best ride in terms of uh, the, the vertical accelerations that you'll experience as you're driving along and it will also give you the best conformity to terrain, the best axle articulation. But if you have very soft, very long travel suspension, you'll have fairly poor handling and vehicle stability. It will tend to lean over a lot in corners. <laughs> Now, that might be an acceptable compromise. It depends very much on the application for your vehicle. The other thing to consider, of course, is that if you do have very soft, very long travel suspension, if you vary the load in the vehicle significantly, then a very soft suspension will mean that the vehicle will tend to pitch up or down as you load it up. So you have to decide what compromise you're prepared to accept. If all of the vehicle's wheels are driven, so 4x4, four 6x6, four, six six, whatever, then we would like each of the wheels to carry an equal proportion of the weight of the vehicle, and we would like the weight being carried to remain constant. So as the vehicle drives over lumps and bumps in the terrain, we would like the load on those wheels to vary as little as possible. Now, if the wheels were fixed rigidly to the chassis, as you got to a bump, the wheel that encountered the bump would climb up the bump. The wheel on the other side of the chassis would tend to leave the surface. Now this is a fairly extreme example, but what's happening, we've got lots of load being transferred from the wheel that's on the flat to the wheel that's encountering the bump. 
I mentioned in a previous video, friction circle theory, that says the amount of traction or steering force a, that a wheel is able to develop doesn't vary in a linear way depending on the vertical load that it's accepting. So what that means is, in this case where we've got a wheel going up onto a bump, the overall amount of traction that the vehicle has available has reduced. You might think that because all of the weight of the vehicle is still going down to the ground, then the amount of traction available won't have changed. But in reality, actually the amount of traction available will vary depending on the weight distribution of the vehicle. So if I've got a very soft suspension on my vehicle, then actually I can keep all four wheels in contact with the ground. And as one of them encounters a bump, actually the amount of force, or the amount of additional force it has to accept is actually quite small. So having a soft suspension gives us better traction because the distribution of weight between the wheels remains more constant, remains more equal. So why not just have a meter of wheel travel and really soft springs? Because that sounds ideal. The answer really is, first of all, in order to use all of that meter of wheel travel, you need to have a meter of ground clearance, otherwise the chassis is just going to hit the ground. And also, you need a meter of wheel space. You need somewhere for the wheels to go when they travel. So to make a practical vehicle, we need some compromise between the amount of wheel travel we'd like, the amount of wheel space and ground clearance we have available, and how stiff we want our suspension to be, how stiff we want the springs to be. We also need to consider the handling of the vehicle. So if you've got extremely soft springs, you're going to have a vehicle that will wallow about all over the place, and certainly at speed will be very difficult to control. So, telling you to go and buy some springs that are as soft as possible and as stiff as necessary all sounds great in principle, but not very much use to you in practice. So, you need some numbers. Fortunately, there is a universal language we can use when talking about suspension behaviour, and that is natural frequency. Any mass that is suspended on a spring will have a natural frequency. That's the frequency at which it naturally wants to bounce up and down. And that frequency is predictable and repeatable. Now the reason this is important is that the vehicle you're designing or building could be anything from a mountain bike to, I don't know, an 80 ton loader. But actually, the same principle applies to all of those vehicles. Typically, off-road vehicles have a natural frequency that is somewhere between 0.6 and about perhaps 1.5, 1.6 hertz, uh, with about 1.3 being typical. 0.6 is really quite soft. Um, I've put a link to a paper down in the description, which goes into a bit more detail about choosing natural frequencies for, for off-road vehicles and the nature of the compromise that you have to make between ride comfort and handling uh, when you're choosing a, a natural frequency. Just to illustrate the range of natural frequencies, road cars are typically somewhere between 1 and maybe 2 hertz. 2 hertz is really very stiff and is getting up towards um, circuit race car type levels of natural frequency. So touring cars are typically more 2 hertz or a little bit more. And then something like a Formula One car would be between maybe 3 and 5 hertz. So you can see that we've got a fairly narrow range at which we'd like our suspension to work. So for off-road vehicles, we want to be somewhere about 1.3 hertz. Okay, so we need to do some maths. The natural frequency, or the target frequency, for our suspension is equal to the root of the spring rate divided by the mass of the vehicle. This also works a corner at a time, if you like. So you can work out uh, the rate for a single spring on one corner as opposed to the whole spring rate for the whole vehicle. But we'll go for the whole vehicle to begin with. So at the moment, our equation has that target frequency as the subject. And we've chosen that target frequency to be, in this instance, 1.3 hertz. We don't know the spring rate, but we do know the mass of the vehicle. Um, we'll work with a mass of 2,000 kilograms. 
So we need to rearrange that equation. Our equation has a square root in it. So step one is to square both sides of the equation. So if I square the left-hand side of the equation, I can do that by just adding the little square sign. On the other side, if I square that square root, the square root disappears. So the square of a square root is just nothing. Now I need to rearrange it to make spring rate the subject of the equation. I have a trick for doing equation rearrangements. So the problem we have is just looking at this equation, it's not obvious which way it should be rearranged. But if we use some numbers instead, then it's fairly obvious which way around things should go. So if I start off with 6 divided by 2, it's fairly obvious where the 3 ought to go. So I can rearrange my little equation, and if I want to make 6 the subject of that equation, then it's fairly obvious that that is going to be 3 times 2. It's very unlikely ever to be 3 divided by 2. So if I substitute those numbers into my equation, I can rearrange the numbers, and as long as the variables follow where the numbers go, I end up with the correct rearrangement of my equation, which in this case is spring rate is equal to the target frequency squared multiplied by the mass. And now we can put the real numbers in and work out what our spring rate needs to be. So our target frequency is 1.3 hertz. That's 1.3 oscillations per second. We need to convert that into radians per second for our formula to work. So 1 hertz is 6.28 radians per second. Uh, that's 2 pi radians. Uh, so if we multiply 1.3 by 6.28, that gives us 8.17. So our target frequency in radians per second is 8.17. In this example, the mass of our vehicle is 2,000 kilos, 2 tonnes. So we need to calculate spring rate, which is target frequency squared multiplied by mass. So our target frequency is 8.17. We need to square that. That gives us 66.7. So we have 66.7 times 2,000. So 66.7 times 2,000 is 133,400 newtons per meter. Assuming our vehicle has four wheels, then we can divide that across those four wheels equally. We'll assume for the purposes of this example that the weight distribution of the vehicle is equal. So if we divide 133,400 by 4, we get 33,350 newtons per metre, uh, which is roughly 190 pounds per inch. So this is actually the wheel rate for the vehicle. So that's the effective spring rate at the wheels. Usually with beam axle designs, the springs are mounted directly to the axle tube. So as the wheels go up and down, the springs compress the same amount as the wheels are moving, at least in bump. In roll, it's a different story. For independent designs, and it doesn't really matter what type of independent design we're talking about, uh, there is some leverage between the spring and the wheel. So the wheel tends to move further than the spring compresses. So what that means is our spring rate actually has to be higher than our wheel rate. And we can calculate how much higher by using this equation. So here, L1 is the distance between the pivot of the independent suspension arm and the centre of the spring, and L2 is the distance between the pivot and the centre of the tyre. So we have a square term in there. That square term is there because not only do we have the leverage, so there is leverage between the spring and the wheel, but also the movement of the spring is less than the wheel. So we have to multiply those two together to work out the overall effect. So that's probably enough for one video and probably enough for you to digest in one go. This is really only the start of the process. Uh, there is obviously a great deal more to it than I've illustrated in this video, and we'll get into that in later videos. As we're starting to get into areas of increasing complexity, I thought it might be worth providing you with a reading list. 
So in the description for this video, I've provided some Amazon links uh, to various books that you might find useful. And these are books that I've found useful over the years. These links are affiliate links. And what that means is if you click on the link and then buy something within 24 hours from Amazon, then I get a small amount of commission. You don't get charged any extra for using that link, but it means that you can support the channel uh, by buying things through Amazon. I've provided separate links for Amazon UK and Amazon US. It doesn't actually matter whether you buy the book that I've linked to or buy a barbecue. I still get a small amount of commission if you followed that link. I hope you've enjoyed this video, or at least found it vaguely educational. Um, join us next time when we'll get into a bit more detail about choosing springs, and we might even touch on dampers. So, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.